Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our series of YouTube videos on helping you play chess better. And I, I'm certain that unless you're a high-rated player, today's video will help you play better, because what we're going to talk about is the most common thought process problem that I've seen, and also the most insidious. It has the biggest effect, negative effect on your game. And when I first found out about this problem, and I wrote about it, I said, if you fix it, it doesn't make you a good player. But if you're doing it and you don't fix it, it'll keep you a low one for sure. And the name of this problem, this thought process problem, I call Hope Chess. And I first wrote about this 20 years ago. Now there's many, many things that you could hope for in chess. And I have been misquoted or misunderstood so many times on this issue that it's incredible. I've had many students sign up with me and say, the reason I'm going to take lessons with you is I read about your hope chess, and then it turns out that they actually misunderstood and what they thought was hope chess was not what I meant by hope chess. So I guess I made a mistake when I first did this 20 years ago. I should have said anything you can hope for in chess is hope chess, but I didn't. I meant one specific type of problem that we're going to talk about today. But let's talk about some of the things that I didn't mean by hope chess that I could have meant by hope chess. What are some of the things that you could hope for that are not good ideas? Well, you could make a move that you think is good, and then you could realize that it's really bad, and you could hope that your opponent doesn't see why, and you hope he doesn't play the refutation. That's certainly a form of hoping in chess. And in fact, I've given a name for all these other things that are not hope chess. I call them hopeful chess. <laughs> just to give them a name. So one thing that's hopeful chess could be make a move, realize it's bad, and hope that your opponent does not refute it. Another thing you could do is you could make a threat and hope that your opponent doesn't see it. That's a very common misconception on what I meant by hope chess. And people say all the time, oh, I played hope chess, but it didn't work, and I, and I, and I lost. And then I asked them what they did, and they said, well, I, I made this threat but he, he saw it and I, I, I didn't win, I was hoping he wouldn't. That's not, again, not what I meant by hope chess, but it, it could be hopeful chess. Um, let's say you start a premature attack on a king or you, you start to throw your pieces at his king and you know it's not gonna work, but you hope he misplays it. All right, that's another form of hopeful chess. These are all things that I did not mean by hope chess. All right, now that we've talked about the things that I didn't mean by hope chess, let's talk about the thing that I did mean and let's talk about how I first figured this out. Let's go back about 20 years to the US team championship. And my son has a team from his high school. And one of the people playing on his team, his name is Will Yu. And Will is a very, very bright guy. But he was just sort of a beginner at chess. And his rating was 1100 at the time. And Will was playing in the team tournament. And during the tournament, Will's playing strength for the tournament was not 1100, it was 1700. All of a sudden, Will had done something different. And that thing that he had done different made a dramatic effect on his game. So dramatic that I thought it would be almost impossible without being a coincidence. So I talked to Will and I looked at his games and I realized what it was. It was that Will, until that tournament, had been making moves, waiting to see what his opponent had done, and then tried to figure out how to stop him. The problem is that that doesn't work. If you make moves, wait to see what your opponent does and then try to stop them, what happens if they make an unstoppable threat? Well, then you're just lost. And in fact, in my first three tournaments, I hate to say it, back in 1966, I did the exact same thing and my rating was terrible. Now, by today's standards, my rating was okay, but if I was playing today, it would have been about 900 or 1,000. So you can't play chess that way. You can't make moves, wait to see what your opponent does, and then if he makes a check capture a threat, hope that there's something you can do to meet it. Instead, the right way to play, and the way that Will started playing, starting in that US amateur team tournament, was Will would look at a candidate move and say, if I make this move, what are all his checks, captures, and threats? And he'd make sure that if he found one, that he had a way to meet it before he would make that move. And that made all the difference in the world. So I wrote an article for Chess Cafe about this. This is before I was writing my novice nook columns. And I called it The Secrets of Real Chess. And in that, I talked about Will's tournament. And I talked about the fact that if you want to be a good player, 
you can't just in slow games you can't just make a move and wait till your opponent makes a check capture threat and see what you can do about it because if you do it's very likely it's too late and there's nothing that you can do about it uh, there's a there's a position that I put up as a good example of that of a of a really easy uh, example let's bring that up it's number I think 198 let's see if that's it yeah it's black to play here and the question is should black play queen takes b5 well if you quickly play queen takes b5 and then say all right let's see what white does because I'm smart I'll get out of it and white plays queen h6 there's no defense no matter how smart you are whether you're Magnus Carlsen whether you take three hours for your next move no matter what move black's gonna play White's going to play queen g7 checkmate on the next move. So that would be a real egregious example of playing hope chess there. All right, let's bring back uh, examine. All right, let's bring back this game. So that's what I meant by hope chess. I meant you make a move, your opponent makes, let's say, a threat, and then you hope you can meet it. That's not how you're supposed to play slow chess. You're supposed to look at your candidate moves and say, if he makes this threat, what would I do? And make sure you have an example. At, you, <laughs> you make sure you have an answer to every single check, capture, and threat your opponent can make. And if you do that consistently on every single move, I call that real chess. That's why the name of the article was The Secret of Real Chess. And I said, if you don't do that, it's hope chess. Because then you're just hoping you have an answer. And very often, like we just saw in that example, you don't. And what I found from in those last next 20 years from testing people is pretty much every single person under the, the rating of 1700 plays hope chess. Now, some of them play it worse than others, obviously. That's why their ratings differ tremendously. And some people don't play hope chess on every move. For instance, if you get your rating up to 1600 or so, you might not be playing hope chess on every move. You might just be playing hope chess on enough moves to keep your rating low. But if you want to get your rating above 1700, you can't play that way. When you play slow games, and when I say slow games, let's say games with at least 30 minutes on each side with maybe like, let's say a five second time delay or increment. If you're playing 35 games or slower, or maybe 30 zero, but 30 zero is getting a lot, lot faster. If you're playing slow games, you can't play hope chess. Now, if you're playing a speed game, where you're, each side has five minutes, well, you're going to be playing hope chess unless you're a really, really good player. Because that's what happens. You make a move, your opponent makes a threat, you go, uh-oh, what am I going to do? Up, oh, I resign. That's the way it goes. So you just can't do that. But in slow games, when you have a candidate move, you're always, always asking yourself, is my move safe? What does that mean? That means if I make this move, what are my opponent's checks, captures, and threats in reply to that move? And do I have a good answer to every single one of them? Because if I do, then the move is safe. That doesn't make it your best move. It just makes it safe. And that means you're not playing hope chess. And then you can play better. Now, once I wrote this article, people all over the world started to email me because they saw it on Chess Cafe. And they said, why didn't I think of this? Why didn't somebody tell me this 20 years ago? This is such a big secret to chess. Why didn't I learn that... I'm not supposed to just make a move and wait for my opponent's move. I have to look at my move and see what his dangerous replies might be. Nobody ever told me this. They told me to learn the Caro can. They told me to learn learn the Lucena position in the end game. They told me to learn, um, you know, all these tactical patterns on how I can do pins and double attacks. But nobody ever told me that when I make a move, I have to make sure that before my opponent makes a check capture threat on his next move, that I have a reply on my next move. No one's ever told me that. And if no one's ever told you that, it's one of the biggest things that you'll ever learn about chess. Can you apply it in a 10-minute game or a 15-minute game? Not consistently. You just don't have the time. But if you want to be a good slow player, and that's where you get your titles from, you don't get to be an expert or a master or a grandmaster from playing, you know, a bunch of 10-minute games and doing really well, you get it from playing in tournaments, in slow chess, and having a good result. And in order to play slow chess, you have to learn how to do that. Let's look at some more examples of things that might be what I would call hope chess. All right, so let's, let's pull up this game. This is a game a student played many years ago. And he was black, and white played d4, and he played d5. And white played knight f3, and he played bishop f5, and white played c4. And here, black should probably either take the pawn or play c6 or something. 
He plays knight c6, and white plays c, takes d5. And now what black should do is he should take the pawn, queen takes d5, and when white plays knight c3, he should move the queen. That's what he should do. But instead, my student, who was playing a slow game here, took very, very little time and quickly played knight to b4. And after the game, when I said, why did you make that move? He said, I wanted to see if he would stop my fork on c2. Now that's not hope just in the sense that he's hoping that white doesn't see this. That's making a threat and hope your opponent doesn't see it, which as I said, was not what I was calling hope chess. It's sort of hopeful chess. But it is hope chess because he's not looking at white's checks, captures, and threats. And if you look at this position and you say, what are all the checks, captures, and threats that white has? White only has one check, and that's queen a4 check, but that's a double attack of the knight and the king, and there's no move here that saves the knight. If he plays c6, we can just take the knight. If he plays knight c6, we can just take the knight. So any move that gets black out of check here loses the knight. So that's why that's hope chess. It's not hope chess because he's hoping to get this fork in. If there were no white check here that would win the knight, then it, it, by my definition, this wouldn't be hope chess at all. It would be hopeful chess. But it's hope chess because he didn't look at queen a4 check. And when I said to my student, did you take the time before you played knight to b4 to look to see if he had a move like queen a4 check? My student said, of course not. I just wanted to go for that fork and I'm just being honest with you and that's what I wanted to do. Well, he is being honest and I appreciate it, but it is hope chess because he played knight to b4 and he didn't look for queen a4 check, which easily wins the knight and wins the game. And his opponent did find queen a4 check and won the game. Now suppose white didn't have queen a4 check. He could still stop the fork. He could play knight to a3 and guard that square a second time so that knight c2 is not a good move for black. So there were easy defenses to knight to c2. It wasn't like knight to b4 was an unstoppable threat if white didn't have queen a4 check. It was easily stopped. But the best way to stop knight c2 check, of course, is queen a4 check. All right, let's take another look at another example. Okay, let's go to black's 25th move here. So black plays g5. What should white play? Well, if you want to take this as a quiz, you can. You can look at the board for a while and see what you would play. And so let's assume you've started the video, you never stopped it. The right move for white here on g5 is to play this Zwischenzug which is an in-between move. Knight takes f8. When, when your opponent attacks something with something worth less, you either have to just move it to a safe square or take something. So here, white really only has two reasonable moves. He can play bishop to d2, or he can play knight takes f8. It turns out that knight takes f8 is more accurate because if black takes on f8, white can now play bishop d2. And the game is roughly even. The knight on c4 is much better than the bishop on d2, so black has an advantage. But the material is even, and there's still a lot of fight in the game. It turns out that, for clever reasons, bishop d2 is not as safe, because black can play bishop to c1, and no matter where white moves the rook, he's got a little bit of a problem. Suppose he plays rook to e1, then black can play knight takes d2, rook takes d2, bishop b4 with a skewer. Um, and, and so on. There's, there's a bunch of you know, annoying things that uh, black can do to white here. So because of this move, bishop to a3, it's a little bit better to first take the bishop before you save the, bi the bishop. But in the game, white was paying no attention to what was black could do to him. He said, oh, I've got this nice knight up here on e6 that's causing all kinds of problems, and I like the fact that my bishop is guarding these squares. So he very quickly played bishop to g3, not looking at black's checks, captures, and threats. That's hope chess. Black said, oh, thank you very much for the knight fork. Your bishop has removed his own guard on that square, and white is now losing. So this is hope chess. Hope chess is where you play here. You don't look for his checks, captures, and threats to make sure that you can meet them. And when he plays there, black plays knight e3 check, and black wins. 
All right, the next example. All right, is a little more complicated. This is black to play, and white has just played knight to c6, which is not a good move, but he's hoping that black will go wrong, which of course is not hope chess, that's hopeful chess. You know, again, a lot of people want to call that hope chess, and my feeling is, okay, that's not what I meant, but if you want to call it hopeful chess, hope, hope chess, <laughs> and call everything you're hoping for hope chess, that's okay. But the reason why it really doesn't work is black has a very clever removal of the guard. He's going to push the e-pawn and check the king. This is the check that you have to make sure you can meet. Well, you could say, I've got it attacked twice. He's only got it guarded once. But if you take and black takes check and white takes the pawn, then now the king is not guarding the rook anymore. And black has a threat, king to d6, which cannot be met. He's threatening the knight. If the knight moves, he'll take the rook and win the exchange. For instance, knight b4, rook takes c1, knight takes a6, and black is winning. So after e3 check, pawn takes, pawn takes. White can continue to guard the rook, but then black can push the pawn check again. And now black can push this pawn all the way in if he wants and get a queen. Well, that doesn't work because rook takes his check. So the better move here, I'll get the computer to help me a little bit, is to just attack the knight again. And now if the knight goes back, now on rook takes rook, if king takes, it removes the guard on the e1 square and he gets a queen. So back to the game again. So after e3 check, f takes e, d takes e, if king d1, pawn checks king here, now king d6. Threatening to win the knight, and in some lines, threatening to take the rook and remove the guard on the pawn. So there is no defense <clears throat> to e3 check. So knight to c6 is hope chess because black has a check that's going to win the game. What is he hoping for? Well, he's hoping black will play some move like this, and then he gets two different forks. Well, as I said, I don't call that hope chess. I call hope chess the fact that he missed the E3 check, but it was a double example of hope chess. It's the kind of hope chess that I didn't mean, meaning he's hoping that black will blunder here, or maybe black will play a move like king d6 right away when, what, when the rook is guarded and white can just simply take the pawn. Knight takes d4, thank you very much for giving me a free pawn. So he figured, well, I'm threatening to take the pawn, I'm threatening to go here, I've got all these attacks. He's just hoping that white will, that black will misplay the position. But in fact, what he's not doing is looking for black's checks, captures, and threats with e3, which wins the game. All right, let's look at another example. By the way, if I take almost any game of people rated under, you know, 1600, I'm going to find examples of hope chess in the game. It's it. It almost always exists. So finding examples of hope chess are pretty easy, but some are some are a little easier than others. Here's here white plays h3 without looking to see what black can do. He just says, well, I'm attacking his bishop with something worth less, awl, as we talked about. What could be wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is black has a sequence of checks, captures, and threats again. Black simply plays bishop takes e2. And now, if white wants to try to get the piece back and play king takes e2, black will play d4 and hit the pen piece with a piece worth less, another awl idea, and he wins a piece. But if white doesn't take the bishop and he stops by attacking the rook, now the rook is guarding the bishop, and the rook can simply move back somewhere. You know, it doesn't really matter too much where he moves back. And now he's guarding the bishop, and white can never take the bishop. If he plays bishop takes f6, black, of course, will say, I don't mind doubling my pawns as long as I'm up a piece. And he does something like this. No, maybe black can try to, you know, white can try to block in the bishop. But now he, black has a, when he tries to do that, black has a discovered threat with just moving the bishop to f3 or d3 with discovered check. So, so basically, h3 is one of those hope chess moves. White just makes the move, doesn't look at black's checks, captures, and threats. Black makes a capture, and then white goes, uh-oh, 
what am I going to do now? If I take the bishop, he's going to pin my other bishop. That's hope chess. When you do that, uh-oh, what am I going to do now? Rather than figuring it out before you play h3, that uh-oh is a sure sign of hope chess. All right, let's do one last example, which I considered the best example of hope chess I've ever seen. So here we go. Examine. Okay. This is white to play. All right, so we can talk about white white should play in a minute, but let's show how badly he played hope chess here. White, you know, I, I once wrote an article called Hand Waving is Worse Than Hope Chess. And in my first video in this series, I talked about hand waving. Hand waving is where you're not even really analyzing the position, you're just moving on general principles. And here, White did both hand waving and hope chess. What he did was he looked at the board and he said, Oh, I've almost got checkmate here. I've got a move queen h1, which is so good that it, he only has one legal move, and I'm double attacking his king and his pawn. Okay, this must be like a really good move. I'll just play it. And it turns out that queen h1 is the best example of hope chess I've ever seen because white is forcing black to win the game, whether black wants to or not, because now black only has one move. But the one move he has, which white is forcing him to play, wins the game instantly. Black has to play queen g1 check, whether he likes it or not. It's his only legal move. But now he's double attacking the queen on h1 and the king on e3 with a check. The only way white can get out of check and not lose his queen is to play queen takes g1. This is how the game went, of course. And black, of course, played king takes g1. It's his only legal move. And now black's threatening to get a queen. So white said, oh, I better come over and stop that pawn. And black says, gee, if I bring my king up, I'm going to lose the pawn. So my only move to save the pawn is to push it. And now white realizes, uh-oh, what did I do? I, by the time I go over here and try to get this pawn, he's already going to get a queen that will guard that square. So this is hopeless, and I resign. So what white did by playing queen check is he forced himself to lose. This is the best example of hope chess I've ever seen because He's not only looking at not looking at his opponent's checks, captures, and threats. He's forcing his opponent to play those checks, captures, and threats, whether he likes it or not. So this is one of the, in a sense, this is one of the worst moves I've ever seen. Queen to h1 check, forcing your opponent to beat you. Queen to h1, queen to g1. Queen takes g1 check, king takes g1, king f3, h3 resigns. All right, so let's go back and look at what, what, what white should have done. Well, what white should have done is he should have played queen to f3 check. All right. Now, he, he could have just taken the pawn and got into a queen and pawn against queen and pawn endgame, which is drawn. But what he should have done is played queen f3 check. Now, black cannot play king to e1 because of queen e2 checkmate. So, therefore, he has to play king g1. And now, white could play queen f2 check. Oh, sorry. Black could, after queen f3 check, yeah, he has to play king g1, queen f2 check, king h1, and now queen takes h4 check. And now black has two moves, king to g1, king to g2. They both would lose in a similar way. If he plays king to g1, then queen f2 check, king h1, and now queen f3 check. And black has two ways to get a check. He can move the king and let white take the pawn, or he could play queen to g2, which indirectly guards the pawn. The problem with that move is that white will simply trade queens and win the race to the pawn and win the king and pawn endgame. Queen takes, king takes, king here, king here, king here, king here, king up, king here, king takes, king here, king here, king here, pawn here, king here, ole, and through. So after queen check, Queen f3 check, king g1, queen f2 check, king h1, queen h4 check. King g1 just loses to queen f2. But what if he plays king g2? Then again, queen f2 check. And now he has h1 or f3. Queen checks. And again, if the queen goes in the way, we just trade queens, play king e4 and king e5, and we win the pawn. And if he doesn't put the queen in the way, we take off the pawn, and you could look this up in a table base. I believe that this is a very difficult but a winning position for white. So if white had actually tried to figure this all out, rather than just 
playing the first good check he saw rather than just playing hope chess, he would have won with queen f3 check. But instead he played the terrible, unbelievably horrible queen h1 check, queen g1 check forced, queen takes forced, king g1, king f3, h3, and resigns. Okay, so that's hope chess. Hope chess is where it's your move, you have a candidate move, and instead of figuring out if I make this move and he makes a, a check capture or threat against me on the next move, do I have a safe way to get out of it? You just make the move, wait to see what he does, then that's hope chess. Now, is there any time you can get away with something like that? Well, okay, suppose you're playing black and white plays A3 on the first move. And now you, don't, you have no book move here and you're trying to figure out what you can do. Well, to some extent, you could hand wave, you could play hope chess, because white has no check capture or threat on the next move that's going to be of any danger. Of course, you have to figure that out, but it's true. You can just look at the position and see that white's not threatening anything. So therefore, you don't have to say, if I play e5, what are all his checks, captures, and threats? Well, he just doesn't have any in this kind of position. So in a sense, playing you know, hope chess or um, hand-waving the position after a3 is okay. That's the kind of position where there's absolutely no danger, and therefore you can do that. But you can't just use your tactical vision to make sure there's no danger. You actually have to analyze, it, are there checks, captures, and threats? In a lot of positions, my students think there's no danger, and there actually is, because their tactical vision doesn't recognize the danger. And instead of analyzing the position, they just assume, because they see no danger, there isn't any, which is one of the other big mistakes people make in chess. In fact, hope chess and that mistake that I just talked about are two of the very biggest and most dangerous thought process mistakes that there are. Okay, for my video series here at YouTube, this is Dan Heisman. Hopefully you enjoyed it, and you'll come back, subscribe, and see us next time. Bye.